Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. My name is Todd Rothman. In this video, we're going to start to learn about alkenes. So this is known as alkene part one. And primarily what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on things like the properties of an alkene, such as its nomenclature, uh, something known as EZ or cis-trans. We're also going to learn a little bit more about elimination. Now, most of the elimination we did in chapter six, so that makes this chapter a little bit lighter, which is good, because I put some of this material into the chapter six material. So, but we still have a little bit more to go. Uh, then we'll also talk about things known as rearrangement reactions, where we are gonna try to stabilize a carbocation by putting it in a more stabilized location within a system. So we'll learn about that. And then finally, we'll finish off this chapter by going over what's known as heats of hydrogenation. And again, something that we've seen already, but we're going to go a little bit deeper into the philosophy. Okay, so let's get started. In this one, we're going to talk about the stability of alkenes, nomenclature, and then we're going to do some practice problems. So the first thing I want to talk about is just an introduction. Now, our, remember back in the very beginning of this semester, I said that after a certain point, we're going to always focus in on functional groups and then learn all the reactions for that particular functional group. And we already started doing that. We learned about alkyl halides, and, and you could think of that as a functional group. And we've learned E1, E2, SN1, SN2 related to the alkyl halide. So in this chapter, we're going to focus in on the alkene and a little bit of the alkyne. Not so much this chapter, but the next one that follows, part two, is going to be about alkynes and alkenes. Okay, so you'll see that they have very similar reactivity. So our main focus for the next two chapters is about alkenes and a little bit with alkynes. So let's get started by just refreshing about an alkene. So here's an alkene, right? So we have this uh, system. We have these sigma bonds, right? Sigma bond. Here's a sigma bond. These are all single bonds. Remember that from exam one. And then we also were told that when you look at a double bond or a triple bond, one of those is a sigma bond and the other one is a pi bond, right? Now it doesn't matter which one you point to, but we know that one of them is a pi bond. And this is what makes up the rich reactivity of alkene or alkyne systems. It's that they have these pi bonds. And so you could think of an alkene as like a beaker of electrons. So it's this um, let me show you from an orbital point of view, it'll make more sense. If we consider just the orbital of the pi bond, it has this pi orbital system like this, a p orbital like that, and they're connected together. Now, like I was saying, this is like a beaker of electrons because they're so high above and below the plane of the system that anything positive that's traveling along will be sucked into that position. So alkenes or alkynes are considered to be rich electron sources. So they act as bases, right? So we could think of this as a base because it donates electrons to different things that are positive, right? And that's how alkenes engage with other reactions or with other molecules. All right, so again, think of it as this rich source that's above and below the plane of the molecule of just electrons. And so it's really gonna draw things to it that are positive, all right? So that's the general idea about alkenes. And for this reason, when we look at an alkene and you treat it with something that's positive, let's say um, Z that's positive, that Z group gets drawn into the alkene and you wind up attaching it on. Now the question is, does it go here or does it go like that? Because notice that there are two carbons that make up this double bond. So in theory, the one on the right can make the connection or the one on the left can make the connection to Z. And whoever loses its double bond, whichever atom lost its double bond, becomes positive. So this would be positive or that one. See, what's happening is that this double bond is going and drawing in this Z group. And so Z takes that connection because of those double bond electrons. So one of the carbons lost its electrons. And this is the basic philosophy. This is a base. This is our acid, and we're going to learn in the next chapter, I think it's like 15 reactions that are related to this concept that I'm showing you right now. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of reactions that really rely on this very fundamental idea. Okay, so we'll get to that soon enough. But for now, let's talk about, number one, the stability of alkenes. Now, 
I already showed you this chart in chapter six, but I'm going to show it to you again, and now it's typed out nice and neat for me. So an alkene is most stable when it has R's all around it. Now you have to remember that R equals carbon, right? So it has to be carbons around it, not just any atom. So an alkene that has carbons touching it four times is the most stable. And then you work your way down the list. So from this right here, this tetra substituted, then it's tri substituted, then it's di substituted, which is representing all three of these, right? Then it's mono substituted, and then it's not substituted at all, meaning there's no R groups touching the alkenes. So if you look at the double bond carbons and you count up how many carbons are touching it, that's how you know the type of substitution it is or how substituted it is, okay? Now remember, when it comes to this uh, two R's, that some textbooks say flushing it up on one side is more stable than spreading it across the double bond system but you know, again if you did you know it's conflicting here so you just have to you know in your particular case know that when they're flushed up on the left it makes it more stable than if it's spread across but again just you know realize that this is really not necessarily the right information and the reason why is because as I mentioned in the previous video this right here and that right there represents electron clouds right and if they're right on top of each other they're gonna repel so if you spread it out like you do here, that would tend to it make sense to be more stable, but that's not what textbooks say all the time. Okay, now the reason why, let's go a little bit more. I skipped this kind of explanation uh, in the previous video, but I do want to kind of show you now. The key here is hyperconjugation. Now, if you recall, hyperconjugation is this empty orbital that neighbors have. Remember how, um, just as a quick reminder, that when you have an orbital system, like for example, if I look at a carbon that's bonded to an atom, like this carbon bonded to the carbon on the left, well, that represents a bonding molecular orbital. But we also know that between them, there's an anti-bonding MO as well, right? So remember how every single bond that you see on paper, there's another bond or another orbital that you don't see that's called an anti-bonding orbital. And so what winds up happening is if you have a carbon, and this only works with carbon neighbors, no other, that's why it has to be R group. But if you have a carbon, and let's say that this orbital is like that because I'm going to draw the anti-bonding. Remember, the anti-bonding is where the larger lobe is not between the two atoms that are bonding together. So, for example, this is an H, let's say right here, and I'll make it shaded. So notice that the H is shaded, and the one right across from it is not shaded. So that makes a node, right? That becomes an anti-bonding orbital because the electron density is not between the two atoms. So a regular bonding orbital would have been where carbon has a, let's say, a shade like this, and then an H, and if it's shaded here, it's shaded there, and it's perfectly matched up. You see that? So when you have the shades the same, then they can go into that same space and make a nice bonding molecular orbital. But if the shades don't match up, like in this case, that's called an anti-bonding. So you should be able to recognize right away anti-bonding because the two atoms will have different shades, and when they come together, they're not going to match up. Okay? So this is the anti-bonding orbital. Now, the carbon and that H over here, they have both, right? They physically have a bonding and an antibonding orbital. We just are now drawing the antibonding. Okay, so if I look at the antibonding orbital, what I notice here is that, number one, there's no electrons in it. And because a double bond, because this carbon here is double bond, it has this P orbital system like this, and they're double bond like that. So there's electrons flowing right through here, right? So that's the double bond system right there. That's the pi bond. But if the anti-bonding orbital is empty and it's right next door, then those electrons can spread itself into that. So the double bond electrons are going into the anti-bonding of that neighbor. Now, again, as I mentioned in the previous video, it's not really fully going. Resonance, it fully goes over to the next neighbor. This doesn't. It just kind of spreads a little bit wider. And that wideness gives it more area to spread, which in turn reduces potential energy.